Today's conversation is further built on the last conversation we had in which we discussed habit, in which I referenced a few books. Relentless by Tim Grover, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, Atomic Habits by James Clear, as well as Flow by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Today, we're going to weave it into our Neville conversation, and we're going to talk about habit of imagination. Now, the premise of it is actually something that Neville has shared with us on the topic of habit, in which he stated, so an imaginary conversation, you reap an act. So an act, you reap a habit. So a habit, you reap a character. So a character, you reap your destiny. So exactly like we've been discussing over the last few years, the concept of self, the character, the self-image, is woven together as a result of habits. And what we're referring to here in this conversation is the conscious use of imagination, that habit. And he states, now is the time to control our imagination and attention. By control, I do not mean restraint by willpower, but rather cultivation through love and compassion. With so much of the world in discord, we cannot possibly emphasize too strongly the power of imaginative love. Now we're going to tie this into the process that we outlined in the last video from Charles Duhigg's book, and it's the process of cue, routine, and reward. Cue in this regard will be imagination, what we desire and conjure up in our imagination. The routine, from the perspective of impression on the subconscious mind, is the bridge of incidents that is allowed to flow through you that wills the end. So that would be the reward, the end. So our goal is to work with our imagination and build a deeper relationship with our subconscious by working with our imagination more consciously. And we want to do this in the morning, noon, and night. So I want to share my experiences with working with this, as well as some reflections on something that he spoke about, which was brought up in a number of conversations that I've had prior to encountering Neville's information. So that was very synchronistic. And we'll weave it all into our discussion. So as stated in the last conversation and in this one, and emphasized in this quote here, as he states, you and I are creatures of habit. We get into the habit of accepting as final the evidence of our senses. Wine is needed, for the guests and my senses tell me that there is no wine, and I through habit am about to accept this lack as final. When I remember that my consciousness is the one and only reality, therefore I deny the evidence of my senses and assume the consciousness of having sufficient wine, I have in a sense rebuked the consciousness with suggested lack, and by assuming the consciousness of having what I desire for my guests, wine is produced in a way we do not know. So as we've been discussing with Neville's work, integrating the idea that the end, which is imagined, wills the way. So let's discuss this further. Your world is a grand mirror constantly telling you who you are. As you meet people, they tell you by their behavior who you are. Now in this quote, he's referring to the opportunities that we have on the day-to-day -day journey to work with our imagination and specifically, as he discussed, work and emphasize the power of imaginative love, to see others with love. Now we have many opportunities on the journey to bringing forth our vision. On any journey to bring forth any vision, chances are you encounter people, relationships, clients, vendors, team members, staff, people 
that you see wherever you go during your leisure time, the grocery store. And we have an opportunity to practice loving from a place of imagination, which externalizes in how we relate to others and how they relate to us. Now, I'm going to reflect upon my experiences over the years. In the earlier stages of my personal development journey, back in 2004, 2005, connecting with people seemed to be a hit and miss. It seemed that some people seemed to accept me, understand me, appreciate me. And some people didn't, for whatever the reason may be. But now we know where the cause is. Now, by working with the personal development information and changing how I relate to those people, what I started to notice was that people accepted me. I would be able to have a conversation with someone and they would seem interested. For me, I believe it was something that I read in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen R. Covey, in which he stated, seek first to understand, then to be understood. What this allowed me to do, upon retrospect, was to imagine myself understanding people prior to having conversations with them, prior to having discussions with them, and even during the conversations, seeing them from the perspective of, I want to understand them. What I noticed was they started to change. And the effect of that was, they would say, that they were interested in knowing more about me or my business or what I was doing. And this is something that we generally talk about when it comes to communication skills. But when we get to the core of what's really happening here, what we're really doing is we're imagining them from the perspective of love. Because to understand someone is to imagine them as love. To desire to understand somebody and their perspective and their beliefs and their ways of looking at reality and their dreams, their hopes, their inspiration and everything that is an embodiment of them, which is an externalization of our own being, is to further reimagine that and have it reflected in the interaction, in the engagement. So we know then that we can work with this more consciously in relation to what we discussed in the last video via imagination, desiring with imagination. As I had also mentioned in the last video, that I had studied individuals that seem to always do the things that will be ideal on the journey to bring forth their vision. And I would ask them about how they interpreted reality, how they interpreted different aspects of the journey. And they always seem to be very joyous about the different aspects of the journey, the people that they were dealing with, the behaviors, the habits, the skills, the different things that they would do to bring forth the vision. For example, the entrepreneur would be excited talking about how they were innovating a product or service or how they were excited about getting a marketing campaign out because it was going to bring awareness onto their product or service. They were motivated to reach out to their prospects internally because they imagined the prospects becoming clients prior to that, and they were stimulated in their imagination, which unfold in the bridge of incidents via the behaviors and things changing to reflect that end. And I wanted to know what they believe and how they think and how they say reality. So I started to study through their conversations how they were interpreting things. I would listen, I would seek to understand, and I would find different beliefs that I integrated, and I become that because we become what we behold. All of this is first starting in the imagination of how we perceive ourselves to be, how we believe ourselves to be in relation to the people, the environment, the circumstance, the information. And we can practice this more so each day. And there's actually something that he mentions in a few of his lectures that someone had brought up to me a number of years ago. I never heard of it, which is actually tied into 
a sales method. And I saw the similarity, which we're going to discuss. And upon when it was brought to my awareness a number of years ago, I started integrating it and I started to notice the changes. And I never realized that it was actually part of what Neville had revealed in his lectures. So let's talk about that actually. There is a sales method. It's called feel, felt, found. If those of you that are in sales might actually know about this, probably know about this. It's a classic sales objection handling method. You would say, I know how you feel. I have felt that before. And you would share with them your story of how you had that experience with them. And then you would say, here's what I found. So it's essentially feel, felt, found. I know how you feel. I've been there before. I felt that before. And here's what I found. And what this does is it establishes a deep rapport, a deep connection. It's tied into the seek first to understand, then to be understood. And what I recognize is it's actually tied into what he discusses here, in which he states, this doesn't mean that just because you heard my vision, you are going to enjoy wealth. You must apply what you heard and remember when. If you would say, I remember when I could afford to spend $400 a month for rent, you are implying you can well afford it now. The words, I remember when it was a struggle to live on my monthly income, implies you have transcended that limitation. You can put yourself into any state by remembering when. You can remember when your friend expressed her desire to be married. By remembering when she was single, you are persuading yourself that your friend is no longer in that state as you have moved her from one state into another. So a number of years ago, one of my friends actually brought on a coach. It was a life coach that he went through and he ended up changing dramatically. I noticed a big change in him after he had this session with this life coach and he started saying to me, I remember when, I remember when. And I would say certain things, and he would suggest for me to reframe it and say, I remember when. And I didn't really understood what he meant until he explained to me. And then I observed the changes within him as he worked with this I remember when method of working with imagination. That I started to further integrate it into my way of being. So it was tied into the feel felt found. So I found myself in conversations with clients and prospects actually saying, I remember when I had that experience, which would imply that I don't have the experience right now, which would imply that I am the solution provider, which would then cause this effect of them saying, what did you find? And I found this to be very intertwined. So I also started to work with it within myself. And what this did for me, it would imply as I would converse with myself that I am not in that state right now that is having that negative experience or the denial of the vision or the disempowering limitation. For example, let's say I engaged in a conversation with an audience and I started to speak and I felt a little bit of anxiety and I started to imagine that they were going to reject me. I would go into my imagination into an inner dialogue and say, I know how you feel, Joseph, my higher self or a version of me. And I've spoken about this before. I imagine the person at the end, the version of me at the end, having the conversation in my mind, say, I know how you feel. I've been there before. Here's what I found. And right away, I would release from that limitation because it would appear that I would fuse with that version of myself in the now. I would go into a different state because what I'm saying to myself is that this was in the past. So let's work with this in imagination, which by the way, I've been working with this information and sharing it with my clients and they are observing their relationships change in the office space, how they deal with their prospects, how they deal with their clients in leadership dynamics. And what they're noticing is that their character is changing, just like my friend, 
just like we have been experiencing as we've been going through this journey, working with this information, our concept of self is changing more so each day. And what we're noticing is that it's playing out on the theater, on the screen of space, as Neville puts it, on the way to realizing our vision. Thus, the end wills the means. Because when we look at it, we say this had started by the desire and the conjuring up in our imagination and the committing to it that we want to see this end, the entrepreneurial success, the relationship success, whatever it is. And through the process, if we find ourselves reactive, we can switch into different states. And it's more accurately put, go back into the ideal state that is reflective of the vision. Because if you are in that state and you maintain that state, the outer world would conform to reflect the theater that is represented by that state. And so he says, when I say all things exist in human imagination, I mean infinite states. For everything is possible for you to experience now, exists in you as a state of which you are its operant power. Only you can make a state become alive. You must enter a state and animate it in order for it to outpicture itself in your world. You may then go back to sleep and think the objective fact is more real than its subjective state into which you have entered. But may I tell you all states exist in the imagination? When a state is entered subjectively, it becomes objective in your vegetative world, where it will wax and wane and disappear. But its eternal form will remain forever and can be reanimated and brought back into being through the seed of contemplative thought. So I tell you, the most creative thing in you is to enter a state and believe it into being. Now, when we're working with ourselves, just like when we're working with others, it's important to observe what we are identifying with, essentially what we are saying I am too. And what we can do to exit any kind of identification with an experience that is not ideal is to understand, seek first to understand, then to be understood, as Stephen R. Covey put that, and to work that into a habit. So let's go through the process that we outlined in the last video and tie it into Neville's process. So over here, we're working with imagination. And our goal is to work with our desire and conjure up ideally how we would want the experience to be with the other individual. And we want to do this by controlling our imagination and attention. And again, keep it into consideration, he says, by control. I do not mean restraint by willpower, but rather cultivation through love and compassion. We imagine others on the journey with love and compassion. And the way to do this is to understand them. And to understand them is to understand ourselves. So then we say that it's okay that they've gone into a different state. We've actually gone into the state and we're playing out the theater in the same state. So in the sales process, when that reactivity happens in the conversation, we say, I know how you feel. I've been there before. Here's what I found. And instantly, the entire frame of the conversation changes. And then a conversation that is ideal, provided that it's allowed to express subconsciously and the words are expressed, lead to the agreement or the ideal outcome. So if right now, if the five senses deny what the internal fourth dimensional self affirmed to be true, we talked about this in the fourth dimensional thinking video, I'll put a link in the description to that, then we can go back into that state that is reflective of the vision and we can say, I remember when I couldn't afford to spend $400 a month or whatever it is, because back in the days, maybe their rent was $400. But now, you know, 1,500, 2,000, 3,000, whatever it is. And what this does is it switches our state of mind because we are implying to ourselves subconsciously that we are actually not that person right now and that we're actually in a different state. And then what ends up happening after that is hunches, inspiration, and ideas begin to flow. At least that's what happens with me. My bridge of incidents is usually something like if I say something like that to me, I know what to say next, so I know what to do next, or the way reveals itself, or something changes, and then I continue down that thread all the way till the end. Which is why he emphasized, and the wisest reflection could not devise more effective means 
than those which are willed by the acceptance of the end. So a lot of times we like to plan how we do things. Certainly in the world of business, we see this a lot. And what I've done is I work with plans and I think and put together guidelines. But what I found is not to be too identified and attached to those plans. Because I've seen this play out so many times that if I know that the end is going to happen, that it actually happens in a way that's better than the plans that I had put together. And if I try to force it into the plans, I get out of the state. And then when I remain in that state long enough, it forms a habit or I have multiple different habits. And then I got to change the habits and bring myself back into the flow, which is in harmony with the vision. So this is actually working with the power of the subconscious, which a lot of times we say the ways are unknown. That's why he refers to as the wisest reflection could not devise more effective means than those which are willed by the acceptance of the end. And this is all happening via our imagination. So all we do is change how we relate to the different experiences. And when we change how we relate to the different experiences, the experiences that we have on the journey to realizing our vision also change. And thus you have more of a flow deep presence, connected, joyous journey towards the end. This was something actually I reflected upon a while back when I was introduced to the world of business and I was trying out different opportunities, business opportunities, business strategies, and so forth in the earlier stages. And I thought I had a pretty good business model and I was working to do something in 2008. It was part-time. And I met this other individual who had a different business model. And he said to me, you know, why don't you do this business model? This business model works better. And I said to him, I said, I'd rather do this other business model. And what he said to me was, would you rather get to the destination with a Cadillac? Or would you rather get to the destination with, uh, I don't know, whatever the other car was that he mentioned, something that wasn't as close to being as premium as the Cadillac, let's say. And I then reflected upon what he said over the years, and I realized that there are many ways, and we've been discussing this, to get to the destination. And what we want is a joyous journey to the end. And the way to make the journey joyous to the end is to reflect upon the habits that we have and change the habits because the habits are paving the pathway to the destination. We're going to get to the destination, but there's different ways to get to the destination. And while we might not know all the intricate details of the different aspects of the journey that lead to the end, as mentioned, even if you have a plan, it's important to, as needed, adjust the plan or detach from the plan. Or it could be stick with the plan. That's all guided from within. But however, what we can do to, as Neville puts it, soften the blows is to practice the act of repentance, which he refers to as doing away with the delusions. So doing away with the delusions mean anything in consciousness that suggests lack or the opposite of love and compassion in relation to what you do and in relation to others. Because as he states, the world is a grand mirror, constantly telling you who you are. As you meet people, they tell you by their behavior who you are. And this plays out all the way on the journey from the moment you commit to whatever it is that you desire to see brought forth, all the way on the journey, all the way till the end. And we have the opportunity to modify the different experiences that we have on the journey that play out all the way, take the Cadillac or take the other car that you might not want to go in, all the way till the end, and that's a preference in the matter, and that's done by the concept of self, the self-image, which is made up of the different relationships, behaviors, interpretations that we have about ourselves in relation to others on the journey. And we do this by, if we find ourselves going into different states of mind that are not in harmony with the vision, we use a process similar to what Stephen R. Covey had shared. We seek first to understand the others or the different attributes in the journey, and then we feel understood, and thus it externalizes as an understanding. So this is very powerful. So we've been speaking about prosperity. And we're going to do more discussions on prosperity, which is one of my favorite topics to discuss. And this idea of, I remember when it was a struggle to live on my monthly income, 
is an instant affirmation that you are now in the ideal state of mind that is in harmony with the vision, exactly where you want to be. And now what ends up happening is imagination becomes the cue, what we desire to see brought forth, or to imagine from a place of love. As he states, we cannot possibly emphasize too strongly the power of imaginative love on the journey. Practice this morning, noon, and night when you wake up through the affirmations or the inner dialogue or what you imagine throughout the day as you experience interactions. You don't have to do this all the time, a little bit more so each day. And then at the end of the day, before going to sleep, working with theta, as we've been discussing in the last few Neville discussions. And then what ends up happening is we automatically express the ideal behaviors, the ideal capabilities, skills, the ideal ways of being, which through the affirmation and the repetition of doing that, the experience, the embodiment of it, it becomes the character, it becomes the ideal self-image that is one with the vision. And that ideal self-image which is made up of assumptions, beliefs, interpretations, perspectives, meaning, is what is playing out as the theater of how we relate to others, all the way to the destination. So let's further integrate this with an affirmation. We say, I realize that I have the power to work with imagination, reorient myself back into my ideal state of mind. I remember when I was not in flow, I remember when I was not earning what I desired to earn. I remember when I didn't have the prosperity. I remember when I didn't have the ideal clients. And I am the ideal person that I had aspired to be on the journey to realizing my vision. If you want to copy this mind map, the link is in the description. Thank you very much for watching. I'll talk to you soon. Take care.